You're about to enter a world of mystery and the unexpected, where the truth might just give you chills. Stay tuned, enjoy the ride, and if you're having fun, remember to comment, like, and hit that subscribe button. Let's jump in. I've always loved late night radio. There's something about the quiet hours of the night when most people are asleep that makes those broadcasts feel almost intimate, like you're sharing a secret with the rest of the world. I'd tune in every night after work, sitting in my car in the driveway with the engine off, just listening to the static and the soft-spoken voices of DJs who felt more like friends. My favorite was this old station that played nothing but blues and jazz. No commercials, no interruptions, just music that seemed to echo through the empty streets. I'd found it by accident one night, the numbers on the dial slightly faded, and ever since it was my go-to. The signal was weak, sometimes fading in and out, but that was part of the charm. It felt like a hidden gem, a little slice of history still hanging on. But then, a few weeks ago, things started to get weird. It was late, probably around 1 a.m., and I was parked in my usual spot, windows down, letting the cool night air in. The station was playing some old, scratchy record, and I was half asleep, just soaking in the music when the song suddenly cut out. There was this long stretch of silence, followed by a low hum that buzzed through the speakers. I thought it was just a bad signal, or maybe the station was going off air for the night. But then, faintly, I heard something else, a voice, distorted and distant, like it was coming from far away. Testing, one, two, testing. The voice was scratchy, almost robotic, like an old recording. I leaned closer turning up the volume, trying to make out the words. There was a brief pause, then more static, followed by the same voice, clearer this time. If you can hear this, you're not supposed to be listening. I blinked, confused. This wasn't the usual DJ. It didn't sound like any of the voices I was used to hearing on the station. It was flat, emotionless, and it sent a chill down my spine. The music didn't come back on, just more of that low hum, followed by a faint, rhythmic beeping that reminded me of Morse code. I tried switching to another station, thinking maybe it was just a prank or some technical glitch, but no matter where I turned the dial, I kept hearing that same hum, that same beeping. I even tried turning the radio off and on again, but the noise was still there, persistent and unsettling. I gave up, figuring it was a weird broadcast issue and went inside, but I couldn't shake the unease. That voice, it felt like it was talking directly to me, even though I knew that was impossible. The next night, I decided to try the station again. I was half hoping it would be back to normal, but when I turned on the radio, all I got was static. No music, no familiar voices, just that low, continuous hum. I twisted the dial searching for a different station, but they were all the same, empty, lifeless, like the whole airwave spectrum had gone dead overnight. Then, just as I was about to give up, the voice came back. You shouldn't be listening. It was clearer this time, less distorted, but still distant, like it was broadcasting from another time. I tried to ignore it, telling myself it was just a glitch. But then it said something else. We are closer now. The voice was flat and expressionless, but there was something deeply unsettling about it. I turned the radio off and sat in silence, staring at the darkened screen. My heart was racing and I couldn't explain why. It was just a voice on the radio, right? Just some random interference. But as much as I tried to convince myself, something about it felt wrong. Over the next few nights, I avoided the radio altogether, sticking to my usual routines and trying to forget about the weird broadcast. But the silence in my car felt too heavy and every time I passed by the old station's number on the dial, I felt this strange compulsion to stop and listen. Finally, my curiosity got the better of me. I parked in the driveway, took a deep breath, and turned the radio back on. The static was louder now, almost deafening, and beneath it, I could just make out that rhythmic beeping again, like a heartbeat echoing in the background, and then the voice spoke again. You shouldn't be here. My hand hovered over the dial, ready to switch it off, but I hesitated. The voice was clearer than ever, 
and I could almost make out a faint whirring sound in the background, like old machinery or distant traffic. It felt closer, more immediate, and for the first time, I thought I could hear something else behind it. Soft, indistinct murmurs like a crowd whispering in the dark. I sat there, frozen, listening as the voice continued. They are coming. The word sent a shiver down my spine, and I instinctively reached for the ignition, ready to leave, but something made me stay. I don't know if it was curiosity or fear, but I couldn't bring myself to turn off the radio. Suddenly, the voice changed. It was quieter, almost pleading, and for the first time it sounded human. Please, if you can hear this, you need to leave, now. That did it. I switched the radio off, my hands shaking. The car felt suffocating, the air thick with tension. I scrambled out and slammed the door, not even bothering to lock it as I rushed inside. I didn't sleep that night, too afraid of what I'd hear if I turned the radio on again. I tried to put it out of my mind, but the voice haunted me. Every time I closed my eyes, I heard those words. They are coming. I avoided my car for days, opting to take the bus to work instead. I knew it was irrational, but I couldn't shake the feeling that the voice was waiting for me, that it knew I'd be back. Eventually, I convinced myself that it was just some weird broadcast, an old emergency signal, or a rogue pirate radio. I almost managed to believe it. But then, one night, I was lying in bed when I heard it again. The hum, faint but unmistakable, coming from my living room. I sat up, straining to listen, and there it was, low, rhythmic, just like before. I grabbed my phone and tiptoed into the hallway, my heart pounding in my chest. The sound was coming from the radio on the kitchen counter, the one I hadn't touched in months. The radio was off, but the hum continued, growing louder, filling the room. I picked it up, trying to make sense of it, but the screen was dark, the power switch unresponsive, and then from the static, the voice returned. You can't stop it. I dropped the radio, the sound cutting off abruptly as it hit the floor. My phone buzzed in my hand and I glanced at the screen expecting a notification, but it was blank, just a soft static buzz coming from the speaker. My blood ran cold. The voice wasn't just on the radio anymore, it was everywhere. I turned off my phone, unplugged the TV, even yanked the batteries out of the smoke detector, but the buzzing persisted, creeping in through the walls, seeping into the air. I backed away, my mind racing. I didn't know what was happening, but I knew I needed to get out. I grabbed my jacket, ran out the front door, and didn't stop until I was halfway down the block. The noise was quieter outside, but I could still hear it, faint and persistent like a bad dream that wouldn't let go. I haven't been back to my apartment since. I'm staying with Megan now, trying to figure out what to do next. I haven't told her the whole story. I'm not sure she'd believe me, even if I did. But I know one thing, whatever that voice is, it's not just a glitch or a prank. It's real, and it's getting closer. Sometimes late at night, I catch the faint hum of static drifting through the walls, and I wonder if it's still looking for me, trying to reach me through whatever frequency it can find. I've stopped listening to the radio, stopped using anything that might transmit a signal, but I can't shake the feeling that it's only a matter of time, because some broadcasts aren't meant to be heard, and once you've tuned in, you can't ever tune out. I've always been fascinated by my family's history, especially the stories my grandfather used to tell about his journey to America from Italy. He wasn't the kind of man who spoke much about his feelings, but when he did talk, it was usually to tell us grandchildren about his time on the ship that brought him to America. These stories were more than just family history. They were the stuff of nightmares. My grandfather was a young man when he decided to leave Italy. His older brother, Gino, had already moved to America and had promised to help him get settled once he arrived. My grandfather saved up for years to make the journey, working odd jobs and doing whatever he could to gather enough money. When he finally boarded the ship, it was with a heart full of hope and a head full of dreams about the future that awaited him on the other side of the Atlantic. The journey started out well enough. 
The ship was crowded, but the passengers were in high spirits. Everyone was excited about the prospect of a new life in America. My grandfather spent his days helping out on the ship, trying to make himself useful and pass the time. He was strong and capable, and the crew appreciated his willingness to pitch in. But then, about halfway through the journey, things took a turn for the worse. The ship suddenly lost power, leaving them stranded in the middle of the ocean. Panic quickly spread among the passengers. My grandfather did his best to keep everyone calm, but it was clear that fear was beginning to take hold. As the hours passed and the ship drifted aimlessly on the water, a group of men decided to take matters into their own hands. They were rough-looking characters, the kind you didn't want to mess with, and they quickly took control of the ship. My grandfather compared them to pirates, men who had decided to seize power in the chaos and were willing to do whatever it took to maintain their control. These men began to separate the passengers, locking them away in different parts of the ship. My grandfather and several others were forced into a small, dark room below deck. The air was stifling, and the only light came from a small, dirty porthole. The men who had taken over the ship would come by periodically to check on their prisoners, making sure they stayed quiet and didn't cause any trouble. Anyone who spoke up was met with violence. For hours, my grandfather sat in that dark room, listening to the sounds of his fellow passengers crying and praying. The fear was palpable, and he could feel it gnawing away at his resolve. He knew he had to do something, but he also knew that any attempt to fight back could end in disaster. Finally, he decided he couldn't sit there any longer. He waited until one of the men came by to check on them, then he jumped up and tackled him to the ground. For a brief moment, he thought he might actually succeed in overpowering the man, but then out of nowhere, two more men appeared and pulled him off. They beat him mercilessly before dragging him to a small closet and locking him inside. My grandfather spent the next several hours trapped in that tiny, pitch-black closet. He could hear the muffled screams and cries of the other passengers, but there was nothing he could do to help them. The darkness was suffocating, and he had no idea how much time had passed. He tried to break down the door, but it was no use. It was solid and wouldn't budge. The sounds outside the closet became more frantic, and my grandfather's heart raced as he realized that something terrible was happening. He heard the unmistakable sounds of a struggle, shouts, crashes, and finally screams that sent chills down his spine. He didn't recognize the voices, but he knew that whatever was happening wasn't good. Then, just as suddenly as the commotion had started, it stopped. My grandfather sat in silence, straining to hear anything that might give him a clue about what was going on. After what felt like an eternity, he heard footsteps approaching the closet door. He braced himself, not knowing what to expect. The door creaked open, and light flooded into the closet, blinding him. When his eyes adjusted, he saw a fellow passenger standing there, his face pale and drawn. The man quickly explained that a rescue ship had arrived and that they had overpowered the men who had taken over the ship. The screams my grandfather had heard were from those men as they were being apprehended by the rescuers. Weak and disoriented, my grandfather was helped out of the closet and onto the deck of the ship. The sight that greeted him was one of chaos and relief. Passengers were being tended to by the rescuers, while the men who had caused all the terror were being restrained. The ship had been repaired, and they were finally on their way to America again. When they arrived in America, my grandfather learned that several passengers had not survived the ordeal. A small service was held for them, but the incident was never widely reported. It was as if the whole thing had been swept under the rug, forgotten by everyone except those who had lived through it. For years, my grandfather carried the weight of those lost lives with him. He dedicated much of his life to helping immigrants, ensuring that their journeys were as safe and comfortable as possible. He never wanted anyone else to experience the kind of fear and suffering that he had on that ship. As he told me this story, I could see the pain in his eyes, even after all these years. 
The memories still haunted him, but he believed that by sharing his story, he could prevent others from falling victim to the same horrors. Before he passed away, my grandfather gave me one last piece of advice. Always be aware of the darkness in the world, but never let it consume you. There is always light, even in the darkest of places. You just have to find it. Those words have stayed with me, and I hope they stay with you too. My grandfather's story is a reminder that sometimes the most terrifying monsters aren't the ones from our nightmares, but the ones that walk among us, hiding in the shadows, waiting for the right moment to strike. I've always had an affinity for old things, antiques, vintage records, and of course, old movies. My work as an archivist at a small museum in a sleepy New England town suits me perfectly. I spend my days cataloging historical artifacts, sifting through dusty records, and preserving the past for future generations. But it was an ordinary day when I stumbled upon something extraordinary, something that would haunt me forever. It was late in the afternoon, and I was sorting through a box of donations that had just arrived. The box was filled with old documents, a few antique trinkets, and to my delight, a stack of film reels. They were all marked with dates from the 1940s and 1950s, which piqued my interest immediately. Among the reels was a small, unmarked tape distinct from the others. It wasn't the standard 16mm film reel, it was a much older format, a Betamax tape, something that should have been out of place in this collection. Curious. I dusted off the tape and set it aside. I wanted to finish cataloging the rest of the box before delving into what could be an interesting discovery. As I worked, the tape seemed to taunt me from its place on the table, as if it held some secret that desperately wanted to be unearthed. Once I finished, I couldn't resist any longer. I took the tape down to the small screening room in the basement, where we kept an old Betamax player, a relic from a bygone era. The room was dimly lit, the air thick with the musty smell of aged film and disuse. I slid the tape into the player, the machine whirring to life with a low hum. The screen flickered, then faded to black. For a moment I thought the tape was blank, but then a grainy image slowly appeared. It was a woman, standing in what looked like an old living room, decorated in the style of the 1940s. The film quality was poor. The colors washed out, and the edges of the frame were blurred. But the woman was clear, too clear. Her eyes seemed to pierce through the screen, staring directly at me. She was beautiful in a classic, timeless way, with soft curls framing her face and a dress that clung to her slender figure. But there was something off about her expression, a sadness, a despair that seemed to seep from her very being. She stood there, silent, unmoving, for what felt like an eternity. Then, without warning, she began to speak. I hope this finds you well, she said, her voice trembling slightly. If you're watching this, then I need your help. My heart began to race. This was no ordinary film. It felt more like a message, a plea from the past. She continued, her voice filled with desperation. They trapped me here. I can't escape. Please, you have to find me before it's too late. The screen flickered again and the image cut out, replaced by static. I rewound the tape and played it again, trying to make sense of what I had just seen. But the message was the same, haunting in its simplicity and despair. I didn't know what to make of it. Who was this woman? And what did she mean by trapped? Was this some kind of old horror film? But it didn't feel like a performance. There was a rawness to her voice, an authenticity that chilled me to the bone. Over the next few days, I became obsessed with the tape. I watched it over and over, searching for any clue that might reveal the woman's identity or the location of the room she was in. I even brought it to a colleague, an expert in film history, but he was just as puzzled as I was. You say this was in a box of donations, he asked, frowning as he examined the tape. Strange. There's no record of a film like this anywhere. It's almost as if it doesn't exist. That night, I brought the tape home with me, unable to shake the feeling that there was something I was missing, some detail that would unravel the mystery. I watched it again, and this time, I noticed something new. 
As the woman stood there, just before she spoke, the camera panned slightly to the right, revealing a small mirror on the wall behind her. In the reflection, I saw something or someone moving in the shadows, just out of frame. A chill ran down my spine. I rewound the tape and paused it at the exact moment. There, in the mirror, was the faint outline of a figure, watching the woman from the darkness. It was then that I realized this wasn't just a message, it was a warning. I spent the next several days researching everything I could about the time period, the style of the room, and the possible identity of the woman. But no matter where I looked, I found nothing. It was as if she had never existed. Then, late one night, I received a phone call. The number was unknown, and the voice on the other end was distorted, as if speaking through an old, malfunctioning radio. You shouldn't have watched the tape, the voice said. She belongs to us now, and soon, so will you. The line went dead, leaving me shaken. I tried to convince myself it was a prank, someone messing with me because they knew I had the tape. But deep down, I knew it was something more, something far darker. The next day, the tape was gone. I searched my house from top to bottom, but it had simply vanished, as if it had never been there at all. A week later, I began seeing her. At first, it was just a glimpse, a shadow in the corner of my eye, a fleeting image in a reflection. But soon, she was everywhere, standing at the foot of my bed, watching me from the mirror in the bathroom, appearing on my TV screen even when it was off. I could hear her voice, too, whispering in the darkness, begging me to help her, to save her from whatever hell she was trapped in. But no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't reach her. And with each passing day, I could feel myself slipping further into the same nightmare she was in. Then one night, as I lay in bed, paralyzed with fear, she appeared at the foot of my bed again. But this time, she wasn't alone. The figure from the mirror was there too, its face hidden in shadow, its eyes burning with a cold, malevolent light. You're coming with us, it whispered, its voice a low, guttural growl. The last thing I remember is the feeling of icy hands closing around my throat, pulling me into the darkness. When I woke up, I was in the same room as the woman from the tape. The same wooden walls, the same old furniture, the same suffocating silence. I looked around in horror, realizing where I was. I was trapped in the tape, and now as I sit here writing this, I can see you, watching me, reading my words, and I need your help. Please, before it's too late. Find a way to destroy the tape, burn it, smash it, do whatever it takes. But whatever you do, don't watch it. Because if you do, you'll end up here too. And once you're here, there's no way out.